the question then, and starting into the 1950s, was can an immune system really recognize individual components of cancer? Where, is that, where does that evidence come from? And this experiment, I think, will look very similar to the Newcastle disease uh, experiments that I showed just before, where that if you take a mouse and, and put a bit of tumor on its hind side, allow the mouse to live with the tumor, to allow the tumor and its own immune system to circulate with that tumor, but then take the tumor away, either by taking it out by surgery or to ligating it, and then give a bit of the tumor back again, the mouse is able to regress it on its own. And this is a tremendous response, but indicative of this initial priming, this initial exposure to, an, uh, to a cancer is what ultimately led to its regression later. You could imagine that this is very similar to the way that we use vaccines now. This is why you all get flu vaccines, which you should this year, is that you take a small piece of that, bits of the antigen of the flu uh, virus, and you expose your own body to it. So that once your body sees that infection in the future, it's able to regress it before it matters. It's not that it protects you from ever seeing the virus, but it allows your immune system to respond to it if you do. And so then the question is, what are the bits of cancer that make it recognizable to the immune system? Why is the cancer foreign in the immune system, in the eyes of the immune system? And in that context, it's useful to take a step back to, to talk about sort of what makes a cancer a cancer. And what makes a cancer a cancer is the serial accumulation of mutations. When we typically think about mutations, we think about the genes that you develop from your, your parents that you might give on to your children. But mutations in the context of cancer only happen in the cancer. These generally are not things that you pass along to your family. But they are part of what makes a cancer recognizable to the immune system because it's a change in what would otherwise be a normal cell. And so what makes a cancer a cancer is the ability to go from what are normal things to the development of one mutation that maybe allows this one cell to be a bit bigger. But that mutation also creates a new antigen. The next step may be that that mutation, a second mutation occurs that allows it to grow more than it should. And a third mutation that allows it to grow still further. And a fourth mutation that allows it to spread. And this is, this is how cancer develops, is this serial accumulation of mutations that give it qualities that allow it to grow and spread when it shouldn't but it also allows the immune system to start to see this cancer as a foreign thing. And so um, this led to the, the sort of theory of immune surveillance. And this was postulated by McFarland Burnett and uh, Lewis Thomas in the 1950s. And I'll sort of read to you what he wrote because it, it's remarkably on target despite being 60 plus years old. Um, and he wrote that it's by no means inconceivable that small accumulations of tumor cells may develop and because of their possession of new antigenic potentials, provoke an effective immunologic reaction with regression of the tumor and no clinical hint of existence. The idea that we may have cancer cells popping up all the time, but that we never know that they existed because the immune system's able to delete them before they matter. That's a remarkable weapon and one that we want to harness now to reestablish an immune response to cancer. But the idea then was that what was sought was some protective mechanism of the body, our own body's immune system, to try and treat this cancer by finding things that are different from the self patterns. What makes a cancer cell look different um, than your own cell that allows the immune system to recognize it separately? So that's where the, the idea of immune surveillance came from. In the uh, 1970s was a bit of a step back, um, a setback at least, in terms of um, whether the immune system really did matter uh, in cancer. And um, Osias Stutman was also a, a, a clinician scientist at, uh, at Sloan Kettering, and he performed what would be sort of the expected experiment, which was that if you had, an immune, if you had a, a mouse or a human that had no immune system, if indeed the immune system mattered in cancer, you should expect that there'd be more cancers if you don't have an immune system. If immune surveillance is right, then if you lack the immune system, you should develop more cancers. And so in the 1970s, he used what are called nude mouse, and these are mice that lack a thymus gland. And as a result of lacking that thymus gland, they're unable to develop mature T cells, the mature parts of the immune system. And yet he found that when he used these nude mice or normal mice and exposed them to a carcinogen called methylcholanthrin, that the development of tumors happened at about the same percent in either scenario. And they happen at about the same time, too. So in this setting of nude mice that are exposed to a carcinogen, 
tumors happen no more frequently and happen no more quickly in the absence of an immune system. And so that shut down the concept that the immune system mattered in cancer for a little while. Um, though in the meantime, many people were toiling with the idea of whether this uh, was indeed true. And this led to the resurgence of the concept of immunotherapy, immune surveillance, and so forth um, in through the 1970s, 1980s, and, and now, um, when it was identified that nude mice actually don't lack an entire immune system, and that there are multiple components of the immune system that are still intact, that weren't appreciated at the time of Stutman's experiments. And some of those included cytokines like interferon, as well as other components, actual parts of T cells, and in addition, the entire parts of the entire innate immune system that Dr. Pardell talked about. And this is part of where these experiments were repeated. That again, if you give a tumor one that's lacking the ability to see interferon and expose it to methylclanthine again, that these tumors actually do develop more frequently and more quickly than you'd expect. And one extrapolation of this has been the use of interferon in the treatment of melanomas as well as other types of leukemias in which patients who get interferon after surgery, they have le they're less likely to get the melanoma to come back. And I'm not advocating for interferon. I know that's a, a controversial subject. But it at least demonstrated the, the, the ability of specific components of the immune system to actually durably regress cancers. And then um, a, 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 the major turning point in 2001 was a remarkable um, paper by um, Bob Shriver's group at uh, um, WashU. Um, in which they showed um, that they actually were able to specify individual components of the immune system that if you lost it, you were more likely to develop these cancers. And this was a gene called RAG2 that actually, uh, more specifically than nude mice, actually inhibits the ability of the immune system to make T cells. And if you, re if you repeat the same experiment that Stutman did, that if you expose them to a carcinogen and then see what happens over time, that those that are lacking the immune system actually develop many more tumors. And so this reestablished, I think, firmly the idea that the immune system really truly did matter in, in cancer. Not only, could it, um, not only did the lack of the immune system um, allow for cancers to develop, but he also showed that the immune system can be used to durably regress these cancers. And that if you treat mice with a type of cancer in which their immune system's intact, and you transfer that cancer into another mouse in which the immune system's intact, all those cancers grow. It's the same cancer, it's just in a new mouse and it grows. But if you grow a cancer in a mouse that doesn't have an immune system, in which that cancer is able to grow on its own without the ability of the immune system to interact with it, and then transfer it into a mouse which has an immune system that's now able to interact with the cancer in an effective way, you can see that some of these cancers do grow, but half of them don't. Half of them are rejected by the new environment in which they're exposed to the immune competent space, where an immune system is able to get rid of these cancers uh, once they're reimplanted. And so uh, uh, Bob Schreiber and Lloyd Old and Mark Smith at Stanford have um, presented the idea of the three E's of immunoediting. And finally, after more than a century of work, we has, a, has a conceptual paradigm for how the immune system can interact with cancers. And it starts with the idea that a cancer starts from normal tissue, but that once it is exposed to various mutations or other, or the other things that make it a cancer, it changes in some way. Those changes are associated with the ability to show tumor antigens on the surface. That's part of what makes the immune system recognize it as foreign. And that if there's an effective immune response, that that cancer can be eliminated. That's the first E of the immune system, is the elimination of cancers before we even know that they're there. But sometimes those cancers may not be eliminated and they exist in an in a equilibrium phase in which the immune system and the cancer are, are coexisting in ways that may change the cancer or may change the immune system, but the cancer itself is static. It's possible that many of us have this sort of stage as well. It's ongoing, but because the immune system is keeping an equilibrium, we're okay. But ultimately, a cancer that we find in the clinic are ones that are growing. And these are the ones that are spreading and causing patient symptoms. And that's the evidence that the cancer can escape, can escape the immune response to cancer. And it's the ability to try and go backwards, which is what we're trying to do, is how do we move from escape back to equilibrium or elimination if possible. And so to sort of briefly jump ahead to the idea of checkpoint inhibitors, which are, I think, the most promising part of today, 
is the idea of that um, accelerator and brake that Dr. Pergel talked about. And it, along this axis here is how, how well T cells proliferate. And you can see in the backside here, T cells proliferate extraordinarily well. And this is where the accelerator is all the way on. But up here in this corner, you have none of the accelerator and all of the brake CTLA-4. And you can see the T cells are inhibited. And this, this is this counterbalancing of the accelerator and the brake. This is the initial work from uh, James Allison in the 1960s, I'm sorry, 1990s, um, that showed that there were individual molecules that played with this seesaw and were able potentially to be a therapeutic target. In experiments, they showed actually rather remarkably that if you gave something that blocks CTLA-4, these cancers don't develop, they stay flat. And if you give the tumor again, they don't grow. Well, if you'd never given the CTLA-4, the ipilimumab, the cancers grow in both scenarios. But then to jump ahead to sort of where we are now, this, this is what we're doing. This is a patient of, of mine who is um, treated with um, a Merck anti-PD-1 drug, and this is a tumor that's just along the chest and uh, right up against her aorta. And then uh, more than a year later, after getting this therapy continuously since, um, the tumor is essentially gone. This is, this is the result of a century, more than a century's worth of work, but this is the promise. This is, this is what's so important. And to show not just one patient, but several is, is these therapies in which we, we showed Dr. Walchuk's paper before, in which they had to make a new metric in order to show just how much these tumors regressed. And this is um, uh, lung cancer patients that were treated with a Mark pd one therapy, and you see that about 58% of the patients that are in this bar uh, had some regression in their tumor, and some remarkably. But it's also important to remember that we still have this part of the curve and these parts of the curve to try and do better. And that's part of what I think you'll hear about uh, today and moving forward. Um, but this is a remarkable start. So it's, it's, a long, it's been a, a long journey, but I, I think one that is um, tremendously satisfying with a few setbacks, but I think the tail is irrevocably forward, starting from this picture and ending with this picture. It's not the end, though, and I think that's an important part to keep in mind, that this is, this is a long history, and this is, not, this, is, this is not where we stop. Jed Walchuk has said that this is the beginning of the end. I'm sorry, the end of the beginning, and I think that's right. This is the end of the beginning. This is the beginning was that century, and now we're entering into a new phase of which we know that this can work, and how do we make it work better um, is, a, is, a, is a tremendous opportunity. Um, but we do need to do better. Um, and so with that, I'll thank you all for coming, and um, that's the story.